Hello, welcome to our program. My name is Jeff Jacoby. Today we're going to be talking about ballot question number four, the ballot issue that would roll back the state income tax rate to 5%. My special guest today is Barbara Anderson, Executive Director of Citizens for Limited Taxation and of the Yes on Four ballot campaign, A Promise to Keep 5%. Barbara Anderson, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for moderating this excellent presentation. Let's start with uh, a question of nomenclature. You're calling the campaign a promise to keep, and in shorthand, I've heard you refer to it as the promise campaign. Why promise? What was the promise? Well, the promise was in 1989, when the state had a fiscal crisis, and the legislature voted to increase the income tax from 5% to 5.75%, that that rate hike would be temporary just to get us through the fiscal crisis, and then it would go back to 5%. So the legislature made that promise very clearly. We um, actually have the clippings from all the newspapers at the time. Um, headlines like Dems eyeing temporary state income tax hike. Temporary was used as an adjective to describe the tax hike for in every newspaper in the state. The reason they had to do that was rank and file legislators were as angry as the voters were that the state had spent itself through the booming 80s into a fiscal crisis and now had to raise the income tax to pay its bills. So since people were angry and people were not supporting a tax hike, legislators were not supporting one either. So in order to get the legislators to give them cover so that they could vote to increase the, the income tax to 5.75%, the leadership told the legislators they could go home and tell their constituents that this was only temporary, we needed it to get us through this fiscal crisis, and then the rate would go back to 5%. Then why have we been hearing in recent months uh, claims by Tom Finneran, the Speaker of the House, and Tom Birmingham, who is the President of the State Senate, that it really was not ever meant to be a temporary tax increase. Don't they know the history that you just described? Um, yes, and, and it seems odd that they would fudge about something that we can prove. I mean, we kept the, we, well, we knew they would do that. We knew when they said it was temporary, when legislators said it was temporary back in 1989, that when the time came to roll it back to 5%, they would deny that they had said it was temporary. So we made sure we kept all the press clippings so that we could prove that, in fact, it was temporary, and we have been able to do that. When they started denying that it was temporary, we took all of the press clippings and we made this collage. And the first thing we did with it, we've had so much fun with this collage, we printed it in the back of an eight and a half size sheet of paper, and we sent it in a memo to the legislature. And the other side of the collage was this memo, we called it our temporary bean count memo. I don't know if many of you remember this, but when I was a kid at the local hardware store, they'd have this jar of beans. And if you could guess the number of beans in the jar, you could win a bicycle. So we called it our temporary bean count memo. We asked legislators to count the number of times the word temporary appeared on the collage in the back of that sheet of paper. And the first legislator to call us um, and give us the correct number would be honorably mentioned in our newsletter. The first one was Ron Gouch of Shrewsbury, who correctly guessed 27. But no bicycle. But no bicycle, because we're an a, a organization that deals with the legislation. We're not allowed to give gifts to legislators. But we figured honorable mention is photo in the newsletter would be good enough. At any rate, we sent that same collage up with different memos every few months. Um, when the legislature changed after the next election, we sent it only to the new legislators. Only new legislators could play because the other ones already knew the answer. We also ran it in the front on a, a big ad, a big full-page ad in the Herald um, before the vote to roll the rate back to 5%. So we've inundated them with their promise, and now it is very, very hard for any of them with a straight face to make the claim that there was not a promise that the income tax would be rolled back. I think I saw in the papers just a few weeks ago or a few days ago that even former Governor Dukakis acknowledged that indeed that tax hike back in the late 80s was supposed to be temporary. Yes, uh, the Governor Dukakis, who was the governor at the time, said it was meant to be temporary. Um, the House Ways and Means Chairman, Richard Volk at the time, said it was meant to be temporary. The Senate Ways and Means Chairman, Pat McGovern, has said on television um, that it was meant to be temporary. So on, the only people denying this were Tom Finneran, the House Speaker who was there at the time, though he may not have been paying attention, and the Senate President who wasn't there at the time, who first said that he thought it was meant to be temporary, and then apparently Speaker Finneran had a little talk with him, and now he, uh, he denies it. But aside from that, most of them admit that it was meant to be temporary. Then they say strange things like, but that was then, and this is now, as if promises have an expiration date. Or they say, well, we weren't the same legislators who promised it would be temporary, which would make a real mess of all foreign treaties, wouldn't it? I mean, that's what happened to the American Indians. 
you know, the great white father in Washington said, you, we have this treaty and you're going to have this land forever. And then pretty soon it was a different great white father and it was, it was off to the reservation. It's interesting so, that they don't apply that theory to other laws. They don't say, well, you don't have to obey the, uh, the traffic laws anymore because we weren't the legislature that passed them. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, you don't have to pay this tax because this wasn't the legislature that passed the tax, so there's this expiration date. In fact, there was a built-in temporary expiration date in everybody's mind when they voted for this. Legislators went home, like Senator Mignani out in Framingham said, um, I wouldn't have voted for this if it were, if it were permanent, but it's temporary. And then they could tell this to the constituents and they could get themselves reelected because, again, people were very, very angry. So everybody waited, you know, through the fiscal crisis. And the fiscal crisis ended. Governor Weld became uh, president or became governor. And um, things got better. The economy got stronger. And um, other taxes were cut. And still, we waited for the income tax rate promise. And uh, every time the governor tried to you know, file legislation, or we filed legislation, or somebody did, to roll the rate back, it was always, no, we're not going to do that. And then one of the things they'd been doing with this extra money is they floated bonds. During the 1980s, when the economy was booming, um, we had this presidential campaign with Governor Dukakis, if you remember, in 1988, and we were, he was running on the Massachusetts miracle. So to make our economy look better and our budget look better than it was, they didn't pay their Medicaid bills. So one of the things that this tax hike, this temporary tax hike went toward, was paying Medicaid bills. Well, those bonds, they, they floated bonds to do it. They paid off the bills right away. The bonds were paid off in 1997. So that was the perfect year now to roll back the income tax rate. Um, but they, they were enjoying spending that money. It's as if you had a mortgage on your house. You finally pay off the mortgage, and the bank says to you, gee, we, we really enjoy using your money, so you're going to have to continue to pay your monthly mortgage payment. Um, so we had to keep paying. And that's why they've been having these billion dollar surpluses every year, because the income tax difference between 5.75 and 5% is roughly 1.1.2 billion. So they get that extra 1.1, 1.2 billion. They don't even know what to do with it. They have these slush funds, they have savings accounts, they stash it away so that they don't have to give it back to the taxpayers. And then on top of all of this, there's that tobacco settlement with the tobacco companies, which is meant partly to pay for Medicaid costs from people who are smoking. So we taxpayers get reimbursed, our government gets reimbursed, for the money that we had the tax hike for in the first place. They don't give us that reimbursement either, but now they have another $8 billion coming into the state they don't know what to do with, and still they won't keep the promise. And meanwhile, the state budget keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, what happens if question four passes, as you're hoping it will, what's the mechanism for rolling the rate back to 5% and how much money are we talking about? It's, it's, a, it's a rollback. Um, it's phased in over three years. We could do it immediately. They've got the money to do it immediately. And in fact, the state budget has almost doubled since 1989 when they had this temporary tax hike. It's gone from about $11 billion to $22 billion. It's in, in to going to $23 billion by next year. So they have plenty of money. What will happen is the budget will continue to grow. It just won't grow at three times the rate of inflation as it has been. This is not the first time that CLT and other citizens around the state have organized to bring this to the ballot. Why has it taken so long? If the promise was made back in 1989, if all the bonds were paid off by the mid-1990s, why is it not until now, November of 2000, that we're finally getting to vote on this? Well, actually, we put a repeal of that tax hike, that temporary tax hike, on the ballot in 1990. But at that time, we were in the midst of a genuine, serious fiscal crisis. And the voters, while polling showed that they really did want to vote to roll the, the rate back, um, were afraid to, many of them. And so we lost uh, on, the, on the ballot. But that was also the election in which they elected Bill Well, but they elected who Bill was well, promising to reduce state spending himself. And who supported that ballot question. Right. So they elected him, and the next year, for the first time, I think probably in, in, in any history in, in the United States, um, we actually cut the size of government. I mean, Bill Weld had to actually cut the budget in real dollars. It went down um, because the crisis was so intense. And then, of course, from that point on, the, the economy recovered, and we had um, other tax cuts, and he kept trying to roll back the rate and couldn't do it. So then we went out to get signatures after the bonds were paid off in 1997, figuring people would no longer be afraid to vote for a tax rollback because our economy was booming, not um, in crisis. And um, 
We went out and got the signatures and the Mass Teachers Association, which is our primary opponent on everything from Prop 2 and a half through surtax repeal through any kind of, of tax cut. Um, they went out and challenged our signatures, particularly aiming their challenge at senior citizens. Um, and um, we lost in court um, enough signatures that we were not able to be in the ballot in 1998. So then Governor Salucci got involved, said he'd help us get signatures. This time we got twice as many as the Constitution requires. The teachers union did not challenge. It would have been useless. And so now we are actually on the ballot on November 7th. I saw that the Boston Herald compared the efforts of taxpayers to get this tax rate reduced to the uh, scenario in which Charlie Brown finds himself after Lucy has yanked the football away yet again. Uh, he keeps trusting her, she keeps yanking it away, he keeps ending up flat on his back. Is there something to that? Is that kind of the way taxpayers in Massachusetts tend to be treated by the taxpayers and maybe even by the unions? Yes, well, of course, we were treated that way when this thing passed. We were told it was temporary, you know, trust us. Um, don't throw us out of office because we voted for a major tax hike, um, but just wait and we'll, 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 we'll roll it back. And then, of course, there we are lying flat on our backs. So then we go out and, uh, and get signatures, and again, the football's pulled out from under us. And now they're trying various ploys to convince the people that if they just kick that football, you know, that, that it's going to go flying and they're going to be all right. And one of the ploys is they have a business group that's saying that they have a better plan. And the plan is much more gradual and you roll it back over however many years it takes, a percentage, tiny little quarter of a percentage a year or something. Um, the fact is, though, that, that that is not on the ballot. And the legislature, the House passed it, but the Senate completely rejected it. It's not going to happen. There's another proposal that says, let's spend it all, use it all to pay down the debt. That isn't on the ballot. It is never going to happen. The legislature is not supporting it, but they're throwing out all these things. Let's do this instead. The fact is, the only thing on the ballot is question four. The only chance voters have to keep the promise and roll their rate back is question four. These other things are just, you know, phony little footballs that if you just trust us, someday you'll actually see that football flying. You never will. You'll be flat on your back as taxpayers forever if question four does not pass. We only have a minute until our break, and we'll get to some of the objections that the opponents are raising when we come back. Uh, but just in the minute or so that we have left, who is it that's leading the fight to defeat question four? Who are these people that keep yanking the football away? Um, they're the usual suspects, the same people who opposed Proposition 2 and a half, who opposed the surtax repeal in 76, who fought for the graduated income tax that has been rejected by voters five times in the last 30 years or so. So it's the Tax Equity Alliance of Massachusetts, which is funded primarily by the teachers' unions, some of the public employee unions, um, the AFL-CIO, um, all the human service agency groups that always want more and more, and who also don't understand that if we spend ourselves into another fiscal crisis, you're going to have another one of those years when services get cut. My guest is Barbara Anderson. She's Executive Director of Citizens for Limited Taxation. I'm Jeff Jacoby. We'll be back with more of this interview right after this. Welcome back. We're talking about ballot question four. That's the ballot initiative on the Massachusetts ballot that would roll the state's income tax rate back to 5%, which is where it used to be before it was raised to 5.75% in 1989. My special guest is Barbara Anderson. She's the executive director of Citizens for Limited Taxation and the co-director of the campaign for yes on question four, which is called A Promise to Keep 5%. Barbara, just before the break, we were talking about the opponents of question four and who some of these usual suspects, as you call them, are. Uh, let's talk about some of the arguments that they're raising. Uh, most of these strike me as, uh, as red herrings or the kind of argument that they would make any time any kind of a tax cut was proposed. Uh, and I guess that would be the first objection. They always seem to say, this is not the right time to cut taxes. They say it when the economy is bad, and they say it when the economy is good, they say it when the state is running a deficit, and they say it when the state is running a surplus. Uh, my sense is that in, in these folks' minds, there's never any good time to cut taxes. Is that how you see it as well? Yes, um, basically that's, that's the case. They, they get their power, these the organizations, from having high tax rates. And as just as politicians get their power from having taxes so they can do favors and get themselves reelected. If not now, when? A lot of the um, arguments that we hear when the conversation in Washington is about taxes 
are echoed in arguments that are made here in Massachusetts. For example, just as we hear when Republicans in Washington propose a tax cut, that it's really a tax cut for the wealthy, and the, the opponents come up with plans and charts, graphs that show that most of the dollars would be going into the pockets of people who already have a lot of dollars. The same argument gets made here in Massachusetts. Some of the no on four people have been saying that. Yeah, and these are the same people who call tax cuts spending ta uh, state money. The fact is, if you have a tax cut, they never collect the money in the first place. If you roll back this rate over three years, each year they're going to collect less from you than they have been um, while they were spending the, doing the temporary tax. And when, when you cut back a tax rate, as they promised to do, naturally the people who have all these years been paying more because they have more will get more of it that won't be taken from them. I start to do that too, that we'll get it back. They won't ever have to pay it. So when you have a rate cut across the board the way they promised us it would be done, then the people who pay more will get more and the people who pay less will get less. Um, I have a really, I guess I am about a typically um, middle income taxpayer. I'll get about $250, $300 back when it's fully implemented. So it isn't the money really, it's the promise. Though actually, um, now that we're having these, these, these um, threats of terrible fuel cost increases this winter. I have a feeling people are going to have to have this money just to keep even to spend on their um, gas bills and electric bills and oil bills. What we often hear is that the state needs this money, which you're saying would be about a billion dollars or so per year, that the state needs it for various important needs, for uh, health coverage for the uninsured or for improving the public schools. They're always, they're always pointing to important needs that are as yet unfilled, uh, unfulfilled, and saying that if we let taxpayers keep this money, those needs will continue to go unfilled. Well, these same groups often confuse needs with wants, for one thing. I mean, the needs are being taken care of. That's why we have budget surpluses. That's why we have huge state savings accounts. Um, the things that are essential enough for the legislature to vote to fund them have already been funded, will be funded, and will continue to be funded, and probably increased um, under question four. But there's always going to be something to spend the money on. Just as we as individuals always have something to spend the money or some place we could invest it um, or a savings account we could put it into. So they really have to show us that, first of all, they will spend it on something important, which we don't know they will. Um, the big priority this year for the legislature was a pay raise for itself. And then they have to prove to us that we couldn't spend our money more intelligently and wisely or invest it more wisely than they can. I don't think that's too hard. I suppose um, they would say, well, proof. you know, if you, Barbara, are going to get back 200 bucks and Jeff Jacoby is going to get back 200 bucks and everybody will get a few hundred dollars here and there, that money isn't going to be spent in a coordinated way to accomplish some important public need. Whereas if the legislature has that, that billion dollars, that additional billion dollars available, they can really focus it where it's needed. I, I suppose that argument is probably persuasive to some people. Only if they've never seen the legislature in session. Um, the legislature puts everything off to the last minute. Then at the last night of the budget, they stay up late into the night. Um, a, a large proportion of them are, are sleeping. This year, quite a few of them were drinking heavily. Um, that's why they, the term Animal House showed up on the front page of, of the Herald. They have no idea what they're voting on, never mind if it's coordinated or worthwhile or not. They simply follow the leadership, which has everything under control, um, and, uh, and they just spend. They just spend our money. Certainly you and I can spend our money more intelligently than they can, even if we did have a couple of glasses of wine after supper. <laughs> One of the arguments that they make, again, echoing what we hear out of Washington, is that this money, if the state is running a surplus, this money ought to be used to pay down the state's debt, uh, pay off bonds that are outstanding faster than they'd be paid off otherwise. Is that a good idea? No, they, they try to equate it with the national debt, which at one point hit, what, almost $6 trillion. The national debt is largely operating expenses. The federal government was using it to pay the paper boy, you know, not just for buying a house or a car. At the state level, they only use debt for capital expenses. The suggestion that somebody once made that right now we should pay off the debt for the big dig is bizarre. Why should just this one little group of taxpayers that happen to be working and paying taxes in Massachusetts right now in this generation be paying the total cost um, of a project that's going to last 100 years into the future? Naturally, with big capital projects, you spread the debt out over all the people who will be using it, not just, as a matter of fact, people who have to deal with the big D who are living with it probably should be excused from paying their share of the debt because they're the ones who have to live with the pain and the turmoil. You pointed out a little while ago that the state budget has doubled or more than doubled in the last 10, 12 years, gone from about $11 billion when Michael Dukakis left office to something like $22, $23 billion this year. Uh, 
Why has the budget increased that fast and that much? Is it because a lot of extra money has been pouring in from these tax increases? And if that's the case, is there any chance that the state budget will start to come down if this tax, the, the cut in the tax rate goes through? The only time you see the state budget come down is when you have such a huge fiscal crisis as they had in 89 that they have to cut the state budget as they raise taxes just to, to survive. That's what we're trying to prevent here. We want them to stop spending beyond their means. So if there ever is an economic slowdown nationally, the state won't be hit with another fiscal crisis and actually have to cut essential services, as they really did back in 1990, um, and hike taxes. We're not talking just about a rate dropping to 5%. We're talking about preventing a tax rate from going up to 6.2 or 6.5 or even 7% in the future. I guess it comes down to a question of whose priorities are more important, whose priorities should be given weight. And maybe this is what voters should have in mind when they go into the voting booth in November. Are your priorities, the way you would spend your money, more important than the way the legislature would spend it? Or do you want to put more trust in your elected legislator to spend that money in a more useful way than you could? Yeah, the Governor's Committee, um, that's the, our ally with the promise to keep is at the Roll It Back Committee. Um, they've estimated that if somebody, a young family who had a child this year, invested their $300 or 400 or 500 whatever they get from the, the tax roll back, right now, by the time the kid's 18 and ready for college, they'd have a nice start on a college education. So if you don't really have to have it to pay your fuel bills, and some people will, um, and you don't want to spend it on something you've been wanting, but the legislature had the money instead, and then you can invest it. Or, you know, really, if you have more money than you know what to do with, you can give it to the charity of your choice. I pledged my first year to an animal shelter, simply because animal shelters don't get government money, and if pe people don't contribute, you know they don't get anything. So people have all kinds of things they can do with their money. Or you can let the legislature in an all-night session when half of them are asleep and a sizable proportion have been drinking, make the decision as to how to spend your money instead. I'm intrigued to hear you use the word invest. You say one thing you could do with your money is invest it. When you and I use the word invest, we mean something very different than the politicians do when they talk about investment. Yes, politicians and, and the types of activists who are opposing us use the word invest as a code word for spending. They're going to spend. If, if we ever invested our money, or if Wall Street invested money the way that they invest, Wall Street would have what is it that Wall Street does? It crashes or people jump off buildings and things a long time ago. Because what return do we get on our investment? We've invested $3 billion a year in education, and look what's happening to the test scores. You know, we're still not getting kids who can read and write. That wasn't much of an investment. And while I do think we have to do something serious about education, like, for instance, teaching kids to read phonetically, pouring more money into that particular investment doesn't seem to be the way to go. Whereas giving taxpayers a little, little bit of their own money back or allowing them to keep a little more of their own money may in some cases make it possible for them to buy an alternate form of education for their child. Take their child out of a public school that isn't working, put that child at a private or a parochial school that is. Put it toward parental choice or spend it on the computer for their kids themselves or um, use it to do something they enjoy with their children. So what happens, Barbara, if question four doesn't pass? If the arguments made by your opponents prevail and on election day a majority of voters turn thumbs down on this tax cut? The politician will get the message that it's okay to go out and spend another billion dollars a year. It's okay to promise things and then break your promises. That's not a very good message to take into the uh, 21st century. I recognize that politicians don't keep promises and maybe it's silly to expect them to, but the fact is you have to have expectations. What else can you do but insist that they live by the same standards that we hold our children and our friends to? My father always taught me to never make a promise, ever, about anything. That simply taught me that promises are so important, you shouldn't risk giving them because something might get in the way of, of breaking them. He wouldn't even promise to take my friends and me to the movies on Friday night, on Wednesday. He said, you don't know what could happen on Thursday or Friday. So I got the idea you should never make a promise. I think the legislature probably shouldn't have promised. They should have told people the truth in 89. We're going to pass a tax hike and we're going to keep it forever. And if you don't like it, too bad. But if they'd done that, it wouldn't have passed and some legislators would not have been reelected. So they either lied or they gave a promise, figuring we'll worry about it when the time comes. I don't think we should let them get away with that. I don't think it's good to let them think they can treat us that way, and I don't think it's good to send children the message that breaking a promise is okay if politicians do it. Your motto, the motto of the campaign is, every tax cut is a pay raise for taxpayers. 
I don't think a lot of voters are accustomed to thinking in those terms. I wasn't. Um, somebody, one of our, our activists, sent me this bumper sticker that said, a tax hike is a pay cut. And I did this double take thing. I never thought of it that way. So I put the bumper sticker on my car, and people would walk by and do a double take because it's a whole new way of looking at it that's so obvious when you think about it. You see union members going out and going on strike sometimes for less money than this tax cut, question four, is going to give them, mostly on the principle, I think, of it. And yet, when you really think about it, working people and union members more than most, I suppose, should realize that a tax hike Every tax hike is a pay cut, and every tax cut is more money in your paycheck to spend the way you want. We've got about a minute till we have to wrap up. Uh, final thoughts that you want voters to have in mind as Election Day approaches? Yes, I would like voters to, um, to show up to vote, first of all, to vote yes on four. If they want to contact us, we have flyers about promises to be kept, um, and they can find out a lot more about this campaign on the web at www.cltg.org then they can contact us and uh, join the campaign. And for those who are not web savvy but whose telephones work just fine, how yes, do they Jeff, get in touch who with are we you? talking about? You? Oh, you're, you're learning to use the web, right? Ever so slowly. You're getting good at this. 508-384-0100. Call and we'll send you a flyer and um, bumper sticker if you want. Vote yes on four. And um, any information you need about this campaign to make your decision on November 7th. That's great. Barbara Anderson, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Jeff Jacoby. We've been talking about ballot question four. Yes on four is a vote to cut your taxes. Yes on four is one of the questions on the ballot this November in Massachusetts. Thank you and good day.